put on my heart and use as a metaphor a gardening uh, or a farming metaphor. And as some of you know, but most of you don't, that's a little known fact that um, our house is a concentration camp for plants. <laughs> People send their plants there to be tortured and killed. Um, my wife will tell you the only thing that we can keep alive are the plastic plants. And the dust of what this life can use. You guys have a green thumb, we have the black thumb of death. So it was a little strange that what, what spoke to me was this, this, this theme of growing, of uh, tilling the soil and planting the seeds and growing the plants and harvesting. But it is an excellent metaphor on how to prepare the way of the Lord, or as Pat sang in the King James, is prepare ye the way of the Lord. I needed the extra syllable, so I added that in there. The first step in all of this is always to prepare the soil. In growing, you have to prepare the soil before you plant the seed. And that's a natural order of things happen. So we need to prepare. To prepare the soil in our lives. And I remember growing up, my family had a small vegetable garden behind our house. And every spring, somebody had to get in that garden and dig in it with a spade and turn the dirt over and break the dirt up in order to prepare the soil just to accept the seeds that were going to get planted. And I loved the vegetables that came from that garden. I loved the garden until it became my job to dig and turn up the dirt and flip over the, you know, too much work. Now what that means for us, first of all, we need to understand, Lord Jesus, first we need to understand that um, God has already purchased the land. God has already purchased each one of our lives at the horrible cost of the cross. Christ already went there to purchase our lives. So the land is there. What we have, though, is most of us, or some of us, will have some soil that needs to be prepared. And we need to allow God to come in and churn up the soils of our heart to make it acceptable to accept the seeds he's going to give us. Now, for new believers, new believers, that means you need to open your heart to the teaching of Christ and the leading of the Spirit. It's very simple. You just need to be open to God's doing a work in your life. That means you need to allow God to do a little open heart surgery on you. You need to let him cut you open and prepare you for what he has for you. And for you seasoned believers, you need to be open to the concept that God might be doing a new work in your life. going through an interesting season for the last month. Um, things at my job have picked up. They are very busy. A lot of stress there. A lot of stress at other places in my life. So I went in and 
counsel with Father Ron, and one of the first things he'll ask you when you're going through a season of struggle, the first question he'll ask you is, what do you see God doing in that? Well, I hadn't thought about it until he asked me that on Monday, and now it's made me think of this sermon because I, I began to understand that the season believer, this tilling of the soil, sometimes your soil's not rich enough to bear the fruit that God wants you to, to bear. So you've got to churn a little manure in there too. So those things that stink in your life, the manure in your life, maybe it's going in there and it's being churned into your soil so that you can become stronger on the other side and bear more fruit. So seasoned believers have faith. Maybe God is just growing you to something different. So these are all well and good. It's a good description, but how do we prepare the soil? What are the nuts and bolts on how to prepare your soil? First and foremost, you've got to pray. Sounds simple, but it's so often we miss it. What does your prayer life look like? I think most people would agree that if we had a prayer life of 30 minutes a day, just 30 minutes a day, we'd have a kicking prayer life. It'd be three and a half hours a week. I made this for a bunch of our friends and some family members. The youth group has probably seen it used in their uh, in their studies too. Um, this is it's a simple olive wood cross I brought back from Jerusalem. I went and bought some cheap chains, and I counted out 168 links and I'd use a paper clip to do it. And what I did is I left three links sticking out the side here, three and a half really. Now those 168 links, 168 hours in a week, and we spend. We just said that spending three and a half hours a week in prayer would be incredible. It's a lot of time that we're not praying. So my question is, what does your prayer life look like? Because I have found that when my prayer life falters, I tend to go through dry spells. See, the Word of God will till the soil, but you have to make that soil fertile. And one way to make it fertile is to spend time in good, honest prayer. Another way is to spend some time in honest worship, God-glorifying worship. Maybe there's some of you out there that just need to make the commitment to coming to church every week, to make it a priority, because it's not a priority for everybody. Maybe that's what God's calling you to. Because the Bible's clear that corporate worship is critical to the health of our faith. Coming to worship is going to feed our souls and give us the spiritual health and vitality that we all need. So we're going to churn up that soil in our hearts through prayer and worship. And once we churn up that, that earth, once we prepare the soil, the next step is we've got to plant some seed. This is where we prepare you or prepare ye in the King James. Prepare ye. The truth is, if I want to grow something, I can't just turn up the earth and hope that, it, hope that it springs up. I actually have to pick out and be very deliberate about the seeds that I'm putting in the ground. Likewise, I can't plant, plant poison ivy and crabgrass and expect tomatoes and cucumbers. It doesn't work that way. I have to choose good seed. I have to accept good seeds that go into the fertile soil in order for the right fruit to come out. So what is the planting of the seeds in your lives look like? Again, first and foremost, you have to pray. I can't stress it enough. I have found on numerous occasions when I'm going through a dry spell, when I feel like God's not paying any attention to me, it's not because he stopped talking. It's because I stopped praying. I hung up the phone. I disconnected. And we realize that we need to, we need to keep the conversation going in order to hear from to understand God's will for your life if you stop listening. And I find myself there, and I'm surprised every time when I find myself there. You see, honest prayer is going to yield good seed, and those good seeds will be planted in your heart, and they'll produce good fruit. Another step is spending some time in God's Word. We all should be in the habit of reading and inwardly digesting God's Word for our lives. It's critical that we know who it is that we follow.
follow and who it is that we worship. Hear what it says in Psalm, um, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and his leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Now, I'm not saying that you've got to study the Word of God all the time. The Bible says that. The Bible says that we should be meditating on God's Word day and night. Not just a few minutes here, a few minutes there. That's part of the inwardly digesting it. It's taking the taking God's Word and that conversation that you have with God, the daily thing, the all day thing. I personally haven't managed the whole day and night thing yet. I'd like to try, but I'm, I'm not there yet. But see, this piece goes hand in hand with prayer. Because you can bet if your life is losing focus and you're not hearing from God as much as you want, take a look at those two items. Take a look at your prayer life. Take a look at your reading life. And I will bet you that one of them or both has become anemic. Found myself there a week and a half ago, wondering, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God's like, I didn't. You just not paying attention. The third piece of planting those seeds is not just attending church regularly. This is what Ron was alluding to earlier. It's engaging at church regularly. It's engaging the body of Christ. It's being an active member. It's coming here with an expectation you are going to encounter the risen Christ. See, corporate worship is described throughout the Bible. It starts in the temple, then it moves into the book of Acts and all through the Bible. And no one ever goes it alone. I'd like to use a marriage analogy. Several of you are not married, but several of you are. When you get married, it's not just enough to go home every day. At some point, you need to engage your spouse in conversation, in relationship, or it's going to fall apart quickly. Likewise with God. You can't just come here and not expect to engage Him and build your relationship and build your faith. You have to actually engage Him and you'll feel your spiritual health and vitality grow. So we till the soil, we prepare, we plant the seeds, we prepare Jesus. The next thing is we're going to prepare the way. That means that we're going to grow the plants. Now, i got to be careful because the truth is we don't actually grow the plants. That's God's job. So let's not get crazy. But honestly, there's not a gardener or a farmer out there that will tell you all you got to do is plow the field and plant the seeds and walk away. But you have, you've got to pay attention to those things you plant. You've got to give them nourishment water and daily care in order to produce the crop you're looking for. See, once again, this nourishment for us, it exists in our prayer life. Regular and honest prayer. We have to stay plugged into the source in order to grow, in order to get, maintain our nourishment. A plant that sits in a dark room isn't going to live for very long. Likewise, a heart that stays in the light is going to thrive. growth puzzle is, is still spending time in God's Word. You spend regular and deliberate time in God's Word, and we already talked about doing that on our own. You should be reading the Bible on your own, and it's great. But you should also be part of a small group. A lot of you have heard me say, I have a friend, John Thompson, who's one of his sayings was, ain't none of us smarter than all of us. You put a bunch of us in a room studying one verse of Scripture, something's going to come out that will help us all promise you, if you group yourselves with people that will challenge you to become better, challenge you to become more than you are today, that you will grow. And that growth happens in two ways. That small group of people, they'll nourish you. They'll feed you. They'll edify you. They'll pray for you. They'll nourish you. And that feels great. That's, that's the great part of being in a small group, the love that you feel. But the 
other part of it, the part that I struggle with, the part, of, the part in a small group where I have to make myself transparent and open to the constructive criticism of others. This is the pruning part. Both are critical to a plant. Care and nourishment and pruning are all critical to growing a proper plant. I'm sure a plant doesn't like when we hack things off it either. But a grapevine will grow more grapes if you prune it the right way. Likewise, each one of us, if we will commit ourselves to growing with people, they will hold us accountable to those things we need to strengthen and that those people love us enough to tell us the truth when we are in error, and that we'll become better and we'll bear more fruit on the other side. Another caveat to think about that is that the mountains and valleys concept. People say, well, you know, I can't grow unless I'm on a mountaintop. Or, you know, mountaintops are great. The view is fantastic. The air is fresh and clean. But, you know, you don't see much stuff growing on the top of a mountain. Take a look at some of the pictures from Mount Everest. All you see up there is snow. Really, the most the best growth happens in a valley. And the best valley growth happens in a valley that's being fed by a mountain. As you're going about your lives through this season, you realize that you're going through a bit of a rough patch. Try to look for what God's doing there. Try to look for the opportunity for growth there what it says in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So be excited about your mountaintops. But look for the opportunities in the valley. Because God's going to be in those valleys with you. He's going to be guiding you. He's going to be comforting you. You see, that's the last piece of the puzzle for me. Is the comfort. where we harvest the crop. This is where we prepare the way of the Lord. The Lord's way is harvesting as we pulling into pieces from His Word. We heard read uh, in the verse from Isaiah today, comfort, comfort my people. And also, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. As we often will read Isaiah 40, we will think, that's awesome. God's telling me about His comfort He's going to give me. He's telling me the way He's going to make me honestly, that's not what the verse is. This verse is a directive to you and me. Read it again. It says, comfort, comfort my people. He's telling you and I that we should be a comfort to those around us. We should be comfort to the body. It's like the prayer shawls that we bring out. This is where we take the love of Christ and we take it out into the community. It's the Christmas palooza. It will be the only Christmas that these kids have. This is where we share we offer comfort to the afflicted. And we offer love to the lonely. Because we do this because we have a responsibility to share what God has given us. What God gave us is a secret that Christ died to give us. And honestly, we just can't sit on the gift that God gave us. We just can't sit on it. Father Stephen spoke a couple weeks ago on the parable of the talents. You know, where the wicked servant took what the master gave him and he buried it in the field. But the good servants, they took the money that the master had given them and they plugged it back into the business. They plugged it back into the master's work and it doubled it. And that was, that's what God's asking you to do. He's asking you to take your gifts and the things and the, and the grace that he's given you and pour it back into his people, pour it back into his community. Start here, but move out. And once you do that, you'll see the fruit that will all start bearing, and it'll be more fruit. I mean, think about it as far as the gardening field. If you plant tomatoes, and you grow these great tomato plants, and they all, they all pop 20 tomatoes apiece, you can't just leave them on the plant. They're going to rot, or bugs are going to get them, or animals are going to come eat them. They're going to be wasted the fruit that comes out on you, you can't waste it. You need to pluck it off and give it out. And honestly, 
you grow enough tomatoes, you can eat them all anyway. You want to share them. So that fruit that's going to grow from you, you want to pluck it up and you want to share it to those around you. And that's the truth. That we are vessels that can only remain full if we empty ourselves out to one another. Listen to that. You are a vessel that will only remain full if you empty yourself out to other people. It's the picture of Christ, isn't it? Christ hung on the cross and he emptied himself out so that you and I could have life, and not just life, but abundant life, abundant blessing. And I don't know where you find yourself in today's metaphor. I don't know if you find yourself where you're tilling the soil you planting the seeds? Are you growing? Are you harvesting? What I do want you to understand is that no matter where you are in the metaphor, God has given you enough fruit to share with others already. The season of Advent is going to give you a, a number of occasions to share fruit with others. You're going to have office parties, school parties, with family, you can be with neighbors, you can be here at the church, a number of ministries that offer cure, people that you bump into when you're out shopping, you're going to have opportunities to share the fruit that God's grown in your heart. It's going to give you a chance to pour yourself into others. And my prayer is for each one of us that we're going to look for those places and then we're going to learn to love pouring ourselves out and sharing the fruit. God gives us.